Hi, everybody. Good evening and welcome to this week's Mind the Big webinar. Uh, today, Dr. Elizabeth Evans um, will be covering palpitations. Um, just, just to begin with, before we get started, we're going to have a word from one of our sponsors, the, the BMA. So I'm just going to hand over to Dan from the BMA to just chat to you about what they do. Thank Dan, you. Can yeah, uh, uh, I can't share while the other person is sharing. It's the message I'm getting from Zoom. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, I, I won't be too long, guys. Don't worry. I'll just share my screen really quickly. I could actually be able to see that now. Um, so, yeah, uh, just really quickly for me before you guys kick off today. Um, actually, I'm going to put a couple of uh, links in the in the chat first. Oh, I'll do it at the end. Oh, there you go. I, I can do it now. Um, yeah, and maybe it needs to be reposted. Um, there you go. So they're in there, right? Let's just do this. Enough laughing around from me. Um, so yeah. Uh, so just for I, I, I talk. Um, yeah, you you'll see there's a QR code on the screen. Um, so it's 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 just if you want to sign up to hear from the BMA, it doesn't necessarily it doesn't mean that you're that you're that you're joining as a member. Um, it's just sort of a free support pack um, to you, regardless of whether you're, you you want to join or not, or whether you're already a member. Um, so yeah, usually you, we sort of see you throughout the year. In person, obviously, we're, we're still not quite out there yet seeing you guys. So you'd normally get sort of pens and all sort of normal freebies from us. So it's just a way of us giving you something for free. Um, so yeah, there's there's a junior doctor employment guide. I understand some of you students, some some of you juniors on here tonight. Um, so there's there's junior doctor employment guide, which is sort of relative to all. Um, there's an ethics toolkit, which gives a bit of a breakdown uh, into sort of uh, cam, uh, common ethical problems you, you might face and, and ways of solving them. Um, you've got revision uh, tips and tricks with Dr. Matt Morgan, um, and then there's uh, looking after yourself uh, sort of session and question and answer with uh, uh, Dr. Alex George. Um, so yeah, so just a bit about BMA membership. Uh, I'm sure you're members or you've been a member at some point, so I know a bit about what we do um, and, and who we are uh, and what you sort of get as being a member. So it's just a tiny little refresher about the BMA and, and what we can do to help you. Um, also, if you haven't done that QR code, there's the there's the QR codes in the top left corner and there's also uh, the link for the, in the chat as well for, for that free uh, free support pack. Um, so so we're the we're trade union for doctors and med students uh, in the UK, so we act as a voice of the profession and um, we represent you um, individually, locally and nationally on all the issues that affect you. Um, so, so we're not an indemnity company, so we're not like MDU or MPS. Um, we don't deal with patient complaints. Um, we're here to look after you, your, your development, your working conditions. So, so uh, things like pay and contracts, your well-being. Um, so yeah. Uh, so if you're a membership, we can give you advice and support essentially uh, as and when you need it. So that's whether you're a student or a doctor. Um, so we understand the sort of things you might might encounter as, as a doctor or, or even in medical school, so we can give you um, advice uh, on, on anything you might be facing or you might face in the future. So, so yeah, it's just about sort of taking the pressure off you if you're facing anything you feel you need support with. Um, we've seen lots of things before and, and we'll be able to help if you need it. Um, we've got employment advisors based at every trust, every every medical school who know all the, all the staff there as well. Um, and we've also got industrial relations officers. So, so we've got people local to you. Um, so, so yeah. Um, as as a member, you also get other things, so like uh, BMJ uh, magazine. So you'll get you'll get access to every single copy of the BMJ sort of on your phone as a student member. Um, and as final years and and juniors, you also get the the BMJ the actual paper version come through the post uh, every week. Um, you also have access to our clinical non-clinical tools, so uh, our learning tools. So, so you have full access to BMJ Learning, which has which has over a thousand clinical non-clinical modules. Um, it's, it's all very interactive, uh, with lots of audio and, and video stuff. Um, so it helps with more sort of simulated environments. Um, it's kept it's kept very up to date uh, with practice change developments, and it's one of, if not the most trusted uh, learning tool for doctors and students out there. Uh, also, if you wanted to, you can print off a certificate of approval learning for each module that you do. Um, so BMA Library had a bit of a bit of change recently. Um, so we have thousands of ebooks and journals uh, and researches uh, resources uh, that you can you can access from anywhere. Um, you have. You, we have a new thing called Clinical Key, so so it's basically a, a medical search engine where you can where you can search conditions, um, sort of guidelines and drugs, and watch step by step procedure videos. Um, really cool. You guys might have come across Clinical Key before, but now it's included uh, as part of BMA membership. Um, so yeah. You can use it on your phone, laptop, and, and it'll help sort of diagnose uh, quicker and help you dig down into a bit more detail. Uh, really, really useful tool. 
Um, if you're thinking about specialty options, uh, we, we, we have a specialty explorer uh, tool, which helps you get a bit of a better picture of what suits you best. So that was an online psychometric test, which takes about 20, 20 minutes to complete. It asks all sorts of uh, work-life balance questions and then gives you a really detailed report uh, with lots of graphs and, and, and charts um, listing the top suit specialties according to the answers you've given. Um, Really, really easy to use and covers all, all specialties and our, our reports are always really uh, interesting and, and thorough. Um, always sort of brings up some things that the people don't think that it would be quite suits them, but when they when they think about it and their answers, it, it does make sense. Um, if if any time you feel uh, you'd like to speak to someone about your well-being, uh, our support services are open 24-7 to, to all students and doctors, and you'll have the choice of you speaking to a, a counselor or peer support doctor. Um, telephone, it's a telephone-based service. Uh, we do offer video calls as well if you prefer that uh, and we'll make you make sure you speak to the same person if, you, if, you, if it's more than a singular call to us uh completely confidential and and free of charge and open to everyone so that's regardless of, of whether you're a membership or not um everyone's free to use it uh, day or night so yeah round it up for me um so so if you're not currently a member uh, there's an offer on because because i've come along today um if you join using the the qr code on the screen or there's a link in the chat um you get a 10 pound amazon voucher and, and this works for if you're joining for the first time or rejoining uh, and obviously you're free to leave and, and come and go as, as you wish um also it's worth saying not only do you get that if you join you also get the rest of september completely free so you get a time on voucher and and you don't even pay for this month either if you use this this qr code or uh, that link um so yeah memberships free for freshers then then only three pounds 16 a month for second and third years three pounds 66 uh, a month for for uh for any any medical school uh, above that medical school years above that um, and then as F1, it's nine pound seventy-five uh, a month, but you get uh, tax tax back on that, so it takes down to about seven pounds fifty a month. Um, and yeah, that's it for me. Uh, just one last chance to use that QR code to get the free support pack um, and an employment guide. Um, yeah, that's also it's also in the in the chat anyway, I believe, or in the, in the comments. Sorry, so you can you can use that at any time. I will stop sharing my screen now. Brilliant. Thanks so and much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And I hope the session goes well. Thanks so much. I, I, I put the comments or the, the links in the chat as well. So if anyone would like to join, it's a really good, good union to be a part of. So, so please do, do consider joining. Uh, thanks so much, Dan. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So now I'm just going to hand over to Lizzie, who's going to um, do today's topic, and it's going to be on palpitations. It's an, it's an interactive session. Please do drop any questions in the comments section, and I will pass them on to her. Great, thank you. So um, hello everyone, my name's uh, Lizzie and I am an FC2 anaesthetics ACCS trainee in South West London. Um, so today we're going to be doing palpitations, um, which is quite a big subject. Um, so we're going to um, try by the end of the session to get you to be a bit more confident in approaching patients who present with palpitations, um, focusing on some history taken, ECG interpretation, how to investigate them, and emergency management of some key uh, presentations. So um, some of the slides are a bit wordy, so um, we'll see how we go. I'm open to feedback um, on how you feel the session has gone. We're going to be doing it mostly case-based um, because I think that's a bit more of an interesting way to do so. Um, but for case-based to work, I do need you to try and interact. Um, I can't see any of you, so Ati is going to be um, my eyes and ears and tell me all the questions that are coming in or the answers. If you comment down uh, in the comment section, uh, your answers to the, the questions, and then um, we will discuss them. It's a safe space. There's no silly questions, silly answers, so, um, or silly questions. So um, just have a go and we can get some discussions going. So you are the F1 working in A&E. And the next patient you've picked up is Miss Kay. She's a 24 year old lady who, surprise, surprise, has presented with palpitations. So interactive straight off the bat. So before you even go and see the patient, you're gonna be thinking about what things am I worried about? What things do I want to ask her? So when you go in there, you're a little bit more prepared. So what questions would you like to ask as part of your history? So if you can write in the comments some key things that you'd like to ask her, um, specifically about the palpitations. And remember the purpose of your history is to think of as, as many differentials as possible. So thinking about palpitations, what are all of the things it could be across all different systems? And how am I going to use my history to narrow down my differentials, to test my hypotheses and come up with 
the, the differentials that I'm going to use my investigations to test further for. So I'll just give you um, a couple of minutes, just put the time on. And just, it doesn't have to be long things, just some key symptoms or key questions that you'd like to ask as part of your history. So we've had a few really good answers coming on already. Firstly, mm -hmm. what she actually means by palpitations. Yeah, great. Uh, another one is other signs and symptoms. Mm -hmm. Then has this happened before? Yeah, great. Then when these symptoms began, mm -hmm. uh, did anything precede the palpitations? Yeah, okay. Then onset, duration, triggers, frequency, mm -hmm. uh, and, and sort of understanding more about the quality of the palpitations, like just trying to characterize it more. Yeah, lovely. To those people who've put about the quality of the palpitations, are there any specific questions that you would ask? And someone else, I think, said any other signs or symptoms. Could you, obviously, it's good to start with open questions, but are there any specific symptoms that you're worried about that you would like to specifically ask for? So remember, you need to think about what I always do is what is the worst case scenario this could be? And how am I going to hopefully rule that out? So we've had a couple of those as well. So um, specifically asking about chest pain and breathlessness. Good. Yeah. Um, asking about any loss of consciousness as well. Good. Um, other suggestions, uh, shortness of breath, pain, dizziness, uh, loss of consciousness. Good. Uh, any relation to exercise and, you know, when the, when the symptoms come on. Good. Lovely. They all sound good. Any other ones coming in? Shall we? Yeah. Um, feeling of sense of doom. Yeah. Um, a feeling of heaviness. Uh, is there any pain on inspiration? Is there a fluttering sensation in the chest? Yeah. Good. Good. All good ideas. Lovely. Any other ones or should we go on to the next slide? I think, I think we should be good to carry on. Yeah. Perfect, lovely. So all really good suggestions. Thank you for getting involved. So this is what I've come up with. So describing the palpitations, I agree. So we want to kind of clarify, is this a misbeat? So can you feel um, every now and then your heart's beats kind of drop, either drop in or skip in a beat? Um, can they get a sense of whether it's regular or uh, irregular? Have they got the sensation that it's their normal heartbeat but going fast? So what I tend to ask is, is it that you can feel your heart racing against your chest or is it like a fluttering, like a butterfly in the chest? Um, when did it start? So I think someone, someone said um, when, where, how long? So I think qualifying, um, how long ago did it start? So has it been going on for several years? What's the frequency? Is it something that is crescendoing so it's getting worse and getting more frequent? Or is it one of these things that happens every couple of months or it's actually all started the last 24 hours and you've never had something like this before. The red flags with any history that you're taking, the red flags are things that you definitely need to ask. And again, it's catastrophizing saying, okay, what's the worst, before I even walk in and look at this patient, what's the worst thing I'm worried about? So your shortness of breath, your chest pain, your symptoms of heart failure is that the palpitations are potentially so bad that the heart is starting to fail. So it's not a sufficient pump. You're getting backlogging, pulmonary edema, or there's such a high um, work, uh, work on the myocardium that you're now not getting adequate perfusion to the coronary arteries. Your syncope, your lightheadedness is suggesting that you're not getting sufficient cardiac output, so you're getting cerebral hyperperfusion. And again, that's a medical emergency that we need to treat. So your red flags always, if, you know, it's not just for OSCEs, it's for real life. What am I gonna, what's the main things I'm worried about and how can I rule them out quickly? Or if they rule them in to the point that I need to start investigating. With any cardiac thing, I always ask about past medical history or family history of any heart disease, and that includes blood pressure. Um, and if there's any history of sudden cardiac death in the family, and that has someone died very young, very suddenly in the family, because then you're thinking about your uh, long QT syndromes, your Brigada syndromes, your channelopathies, uh, your cardiomyopathies that run in the family that would put someone at a higher risk of significant palpitations. With heart disease, again, you want to qualify, was it that granddad had a heart attack or had atrial fibrillation when he was 94? Or was it actually, my dad had a significant heart attack with stenting when he was in his late thirties? Um, gives you more of an indication of this is, if this is a familial problem or if this is something that is acquired um, over time. 
Um, I think someone mentioned about exercise. So exercise is a really important one. So yeah, have they with, with these symptoms or ever before had a syncope on exertion? Again, you're getting a lot of cardiac output with um, increased myocardial demand. So you need to think about the structural heart disease um, or potentially life-threatening arrhythmias. Someone said, I think, again, about anything preceding. So how have you been, before this happened, how have you been? How have you been the last couple of days, the last couple of weeks? Have you had any symptoms of infection? Cough, cold, chest infections, um, urinary symptoms, diarrhea, vomiting, something that might make you intravascularly deplete and put you high, a higher risk of certain, or reveal certain arrhythmias. And bleeding is a, is a significant thing to think about as well, uh, particularly women with um, periods, are they having heavy bleeding? that's putting them you know, into an intravascular deplete state um, setting. Do they have an anemia and they're in high output heart failure, which is why they're getting this sensation of tachycardia. Um, so all significant things to think about that you may be able to reverse to tackle the palpitations. Thyroid is also an important one. So is there any, have you got any symptoms of hypo or hypothyroidism? Is there any family history of any thyroid problems? And I always think about PE, if someone's coming in with a sensation of uh, their heart racing. Sinus tachycardia is one of the most um, common ECG findings for PE. So just doing a quick, I know we do a quick screen for anyone with shortness of breath, chest pain, palpitations, syncope. Um, have you had any recent travel abroad, uh, any uh, immobility, recent surgery, leg swelling, any coagulopathies with you or your family? Do you take the pill? Any risk you could be pregnant? And just doing quick screens thinking about what your differentials are, can help you with all of that's no, no risk for PE onto the next differential. Another thing with palpitations is thinking about um, iatrogenic causes. So are they having seven coffees a day? Are they knocking back a massive can of monster uh, for because they're starting to do their revision and that's triggering their palpitations? Do they take drugs? Cocaine, amphetamines uh, can all trigger um, uh, um, arrhythmogenic states. And any medications, so have they started new meds? Are they puffing away on a salbutamol inhaler, inhaler that's ramping up their heart rate? As they do new medications, changes in medications, um, are all things to think about. And do they take any medication that might be um, hiding their palpitations or maybe uh, controlling the palpitations? If they've got a history of atrial fibrillation and they're on digoxin, on bisoprolol, what's their compliance with it? Another thing I always think about any recent stress, anything worrying you, something's changed, any, you know, has anything triggered this um, at home, any concerns at work are always good things to, to, to tackle with any part of the history. Lovely. So that's kind of my general, before I go in, how I'm going to structure it and what I'm going to ask them, which I think, to be honest, most of you got. So, oh, is my slides working? Hang on. There we go. So for this lady, she is a 24 year old lady who reports a four week history of palpitations. She normally notices it if she's sitting down at night watching television or when she's lying in bed at night, that's when they're particularly prominent. You ask specifically, are you waking up with these palpitations? She says, no, not really. It's just that I'm lying there awake and I can't get to sleep because I can feel the sensation of my heart racing. You've gone through all of your red flags and she denies any of those symptoms. She's normally fit and well. She's got no wrong past medical history and there's no significant family history either. Currently, she's studying for exams. She's recently broken up with a partner, so there's a lot going on in the background. But otherwise, no history of infection, bleeding. She's not sexually active and has got the call in situ. And you've done a quick screen for PE and there's nothing really there that's jumping out with you. So how would you like to investigate this lady? So really, this is this lady, but also for palpitations in general. Um, what sort of investigations would you like to do? Um, again, if you can put it down in the comments. So I, it's always good to try and structure your answer. So thinking about um, simple bedside tests that you can do, um, things that might be around the bedside, then thinking about um, blood tests and then thinking about imaging. So sometimes it's a nice way to structure your answer, particularly if you're going to an exam setting, but it also makes sure, kind of makes you think about things not to miss. So if you're a patient presenting with palpitations, how would you like to investigate? Remember you're in A&E. So we're already getting a lot of answers saying mm -hmm. bloods and ECG. Blood and ECG, sounds good. Um, for the bloods, could you give me any specific bloods that you would like? Are we just gonna do a whole panel or what should we do?
Have you got any advancements on bloods and ECG? I agree, is correct. But so, uh, CRP, FBC, tox screen, D dimer, urea creatinine electrolytes, mm -hmm. crops. Good. Thyroid function tests. Mm -hmm. BNP. Yeah. Yep, good. All good suggestions. Anything else to add before we move on? I think that's pretty much what that's the consensus. Yeah, good. lovely. I think that's a good start. Well done. So, um, always I'm going to do an A to E assessment. First things first. Most basic bedside test you can do is observations. How do you know this patient's got uh, got significant palpita uh, palpitations or palpitations that translate if you don't have a look at their observations and again remember when you're going to see a patient you want to ask yourself is this patient stable or unstable is this person presented with palpitations and they're compensating so their blood pressure is okay their sats are okay they're not short of breath or is this person presented with palpitations and crashing that's your first question when you walk into the room so observations can firstly there's the end of the bed test there's your a to e but your observations are going to be the first thing you're going to get so we're going to ask for heart rate blood pressure sats respiratory temp and hook them up onto the monitor generally ideally i guess you should really have them on a cardiac monitor particularly if they have abnormal ecg um, and if they have any red flag symptoms so patients with chest pain syncope tends to be quicker to, safer to put them on a cardiac monitor early um, in this ad i probably would hold off uh, just for now and uh, in a and &E, it's also trying to find a, a bed with a cardiac monitor so you do have to be able to justify why they need one um good and then i think blood screen wise we've basically got everything so fbc looking for um, anemia and signs of infection a crp as well for the infection side of things using these i think you mentioned so that can tell you about their dehydration or their hydration status and also look at their sodium and their potassium remember if you want further electrolytes such as the calcium magnesium phosphate uh, you need to uh, add on a bone profile of magnesium uh, which i would definitely do in arrhythmia patients this idea i get i would do be to hcg either as a urine or as a serum blood test um unfortunately for women if you are of childbearing age you will be having a pregnancy test regardless unless you come in with foot pain but um generally it's just safe to screen thyroid functions absolutely d dimer having i'd have a low you have to be able to justify. You can't just do screens for everyone. Infection will raise your D-dimer. Um, if you are hypovolemic, you might be a bit cyclopathic. You might have a raised D-dimer. There's lots of reasons for an elevated D-dimer. It's not specific necessary for um, PE, although we do use it as part of our screening. So you have to be able to justify. If this lady has got no real symptoms of PE and normal ECG, then I would probably hold off. Um, but it's very dependent on your um, supervisor and your kind of the rationale in your department. I think some people mentioned TROPS and BNPs. Um, so your BNP is looking at your um, heart failure. So an elevated BNP is suggestive of um, um, naturesis. And troponins are, well, for P it can be used for PEs, but generally for um, MIs. This lady, I wouldn't add on TROPS and BNPs. Um, I think given the history with no chest pain um, and intermittent palpitations, I would hold off a troponin. Remember that if someone is, is in a true arrhythmia and is a tachyarrhythmia, they're going to have an elevated troponin because they are, um, because of the uh, increased oxygen requirement on the heart, they're going to go into a bit of an ischemic picture. And sometimes you can get ST depressions across multiple leads when you have a tachyarrhythmia. So I think you have to again you have to be able to rationalize why or give a rationale for why you're doing a blood test so troponin bnp is certainly something to bear in mind if you're concerned this person has had a cardiac event but bearing in mind the patient profile in front of us 24 year old who's normally fit and well with no significant cardiac background or family history i probably hold off the troponin bnp for now you definitely need an ecg um, remember with ecgs unless they're having the symptoms of palpitation you may not pick up something um, so it is a snapshot, but absolutely get an ECG. And I said urine dip mainly for the 
um, beat HCG, but if you're concerned that there might be um, signs of infection, then urine dip, a chest x-ray would be appropriate. Uh, and if there's shortness of breath, signs of heart failure, um, it may be appropriate to get a chest x-ray depending on how stable the patient is. Lovely. So with this lady, uh, you do an A to E assessment. Her airway is patent. From a B perspective, it seems okay. C, she's a bit tacky at 105, but it's regular. Her blood pressure is good and there's no signs of heart failure. Abdomen's fine. Um, her system is otherwise okay. And her blood panel has come back um, for everything you've mentioned and is negative. Oh, I think someone said um, to talk screen as well. Um, talk screen, we don't tend to do that often, generally because um, the main talk screens we do is paracetamol and salicylate for overdoses. And if there's any overdose, you always add on a paracetamol level and salicylate because you don't want to miss it. Um, unless obviously, but bear in mind if you've given paracetamol in the department. Um, talk screens, occasionally we've done if, for example, if they're underage or if you think it might help the diagnosis, but they take a while to come back. And generally, if you ask people, they'll tend to give you an answer. Um, there's not many, unless it's something that's going to be, have a reversible effect, uh, something that you, that you can kind of give something, an anecdote, uh, an antidote to to correct, you don't necessarily need to do a tox screen. But something to think about, it, again, it'll probably be dependent on the trust you go to. So, sorry, going back to this one. Um, so she's a little bit tachycardic, but otherwise a pretty normal examination. So this is her ECG. Uh, I appreciate the leads are all over the place. It's not the best ECG. Um, but this is what you've been presented with. So in terms of ECG interpretation, just take a bit of a sidestep. Has anyone got a system for interpreting ECGs? Do we feel confident on ECG interpretation? Um, has anyone got any tips that they can put, um, that they would recommend that they found helpful when looking at ECGs? So any thoughts? You don't necessarily, if you have comments on this ECG, lovely. Um, but really the question is, what's your approach to uh, interpreting an ECG? You got any takers? Just waiting for things to come through. That's okay. If not, I can always tell you the answer, but it's always good to So we've got a couple of answers now on, on how we generally look at ECG. So people are saying, start by looking if it's generally irregular, irregular, check the heart rate, then kind of go step by step. So P waves, QRS complex, ST segment. Yeah, perfect. Good. I think that's a good systematic way to approach it. That's how I tend to approach it. So um, firstly, you check patient's details, make sure it's the right ECG uh, for the right patient. Just have a quick check of calibration, just because... Um, you, in terms of calculating your rates and your rhythm, if you're counting the number of squares, it's, the standard is 25 millimeters a second. Um, if you have the 50 millimeters, it looks much bigger anyway, but your calculations might be a little bit off. So just have a quick look. Then I tend to do rate and rhythm. So um, it's not at the top of the page, but generally you can kind of eyeball. Um, there are calculations you can do. I think uh, if you do 1,500 divided by the number of small squares um, or between your R and R complexes, or I think 300 divided by the number of large squares, it will give you the rate if it's uh, regular. But again, it's normally at the top. Um, then I have a look at access. Is it normal, left or right, deviated? And then again, I think as someone said, just working away systematically. So looking at the P wave, commenting on the morphology of the P wave, is it bifid? Uh, they, do they look symmetrical or is it kind of abnormal? Is it um, inverted and most importantly does every p wave have a qrs complex then move on to a pr interval short long is it getting longer with each step qrs is it wide or narrow particularly in the context of tachycardias does every qrs complex have a p wave and is there any indication of bundle branch block st is pretty classic is it elevated or depressed and the most important thing with elevation and depression is what leads are they in 
So you need to be able to think about territories that the elevation depression will be in, as that's going to give you an indication as to which artery is involved. Um, and with this elevation is only reciprocal depression. And then looking at the T waves, again, what's the morphology of the T waves? Are they tall tented T waves in hyperkalemia? Are they inverted, suggestive old ischemia? Um, and generally, if you work your way through that, you'll tend to find if there's a problem. So what about with this ECG, what do we think? I know I appreciate the leads are all in a bit of a funny place. Um, and I'm very much a pattern recognition and this throws my brain a bit. But generally, what do we think about this ECG? So we've had a couple of comments so far um, saying regular sinus tachy, but also T wave inversion in V1. Yeah. So I would agree. I would say, so rate wise, uh, it's about 100, isn't it? So there's three big squares. So 300 divided by three is about 100. Um, P waves look fine. Every P wave has a QRS, every QRS has a P wave. PR looks okay. It's narrow complex, there's no bundle branch block, and ST looks fine. T wave inversion in V1 can be normal and it's an isolated lead. So there is, yeah, but um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. So, um, yeah, good. I think I'm and, uh, active deviation, I genuinely can't do with it in this format. I have to have it in a certain pattern to do my uh, to interpret it. So, but I assume there's no uh, active deviation. So, this is sinus tacky. Um, and nothing, it, again, it's a mild tachycardia. So how are you gonna manage this lady? We have a lady who has had four weeks of intermittent palpitations when she's watching television and at night. She's got no preceding symptoms from it. Her bloods are fine, her obs are fine, apart from a mild tachycardia and her ECG shows a slight sinus tachy. What are we going to do with this lady? I might for time just jump forward onto this one, but do write your comments in there and we can talk about it. Um, so I would say that this history is suggestive anxiety and high stress, mainly because she's getting the palpitations at times when she's sitting and is not distracted. It sounds distractible to me that she can go to, she can walk around, do everything throughout the day without having any palpitations. But the sensation is when she's sitting down watching telly or lying in bed and the sensation of her heart racing. There's no red flags, her bloods are fine, her ECG is all normal. I'd be, I, my management would be to reassure this lady. I would talk her through the red flags and say the reasons we're concerned with palpitations is if you're getting any chest, arm, jaw, neck, back pain with it. If you're getting short of breath, so you can't walk up and down the stairs, you're sitting upright at night, if you're getting any leg swelling, and particularly in this young age group, if you're getting dizziness or losing consciousness with it, you must come back to A&E. Otherwise, I would say, as we've said, with ECGs, they're a snapshot. This may not, you know, we may just not be picking up anything that's causing your palpitations. We've given you a full MOT with bloods, which all seem normal. If this is an ongoing problem, you may need to have a 24 hour tape where we do an ECG over a period of time and see if we can pick up anything causing your palpitations. Your GP can organize that. And then I think a discussion on stress management, talk about mindfulness and psychological therapies is always an option as well. But for this lady, I would say it's sinus tachycardia. The palpitations don't have any red flags. Um, and I'd be happy to discharge her home. Hopefully you agree. If anyone strongly disagrees, do let me know in the comments. So what if same lady actually tells you, well, I've actually had four weeks of this um, and it's intermittent. It can happen any time. I could be sitting there doing nothing and I get these palpitations or I've been at work and suddenly it hits me um, and it lasts about five, 10 minutes and then it goes away on its own. I don't really have any symptoms. It feels a bit weird. I don't feel great, but there's no chance of breath. I've never passed out from it. And um, you've screened for pee and there's no symptoms. When you push a bit further, she says, well, I guess thinking about it, I've had a bit of loose stool for the last kind of couple of months. Um, and my periods haven't quite been the same as they usually are. Um, and actually, now you've said it, I've lost about four kilogram in weight. Um, but otherwise, no, my family's fine. I'm fine. I have a couple of cups of tea a day. Um, I've got a partner, but I'm on the pill um, and otherwise no symptoms of infection. So 
So you do a, um, an examination and again, pretty normal, but again, you've got this tachycardia about 110. It feels regular on, on uh, palpation. Um, you notice when she's kind of putting her hands out, picking things up, she's got a bit of a fine tremor bilaterally. And actually she looks a bit sweaty, a bit clammy, and she just seems quite anxious. What do we think about this lady? So we've got a couple of answers suggesting hyperthyroidism. Yeah, I think that is reasonable. So we have a lady who has a change in bowel habit, change in her periods, weight loss, and palpitations that sound a bit more convincing to being cardiac in nature. She's got a low TSH, which is um, suggestive of um, hyperthyroidism. In some trusts, so in my trust, we don't uh, do, T, do T3, T4, we just do TSH. And if the TSH is abnormal, we have to resend for T3, T4. But from a low TSH point of view, they suggest that there's an overactive thyroid that's sending, because of the high amount of thyroid hormone being produced, it's sending negative feedback to the hypothalamus and there's less TSH being produced. So in this lady, we have an organic cause, right? So we've still got this, the same ECG, it's a sinus tachycardia, but in this instance, we've said, well, you are tachycardic. Um, we seem to have an organic cause for it. So in this lady, we have something to do. So for the management of her, um, we need to explain the diagnosis. We need to send her T3 and T4 and um, check this isn't, see if this is clinical or subclinical hypothyroidism. And autoantibodies may be appropriate um, looking at Graves' disease, et cetera. You would do a thyroid exam, and at some point she's going to need to have management um, investigation of her thyroid, so um, usually an ultrasound with Doppler to quantify if there's any tumours or anything or masses that might be causing the problem. Management, generally, I think you give a Panelol for the tachycardia, um, and for the management of the thyroid, it's either block and replace, sometimes radio iodine or surgery. You may want to consider a 24-hour halter, um, to see if she's actually having runs of AF. But again, it all seems to be indicative of the hypothyroidism, but something to consider. And she probably needs discussion with endocrine in, in whether as an inpatient or outpatient with repeat TFTs in a couple of weeks after management's been initiated. So in this lady, it's similar stories, but of presenting with palpitations, but subtle differences and further probing has seen that there's a pathological cause for this lady's palpitations. So what about if this lady is the same lady, 24 year old, uh, she's having a really bad run, uh, who has now come in with a one hour history of persistent palpitations. So today she's been at work, uh, she's had three cups of coffee throughout the day, was walking home, felt perfectly fine, and then suddenly had this horrible feeling in her chest of uh, like fluttering, heart going racing, um, and just feeling awful. But again, you screen the red flags, red flags seem okay. Um, she's never had something like this before. There's no significant family history. She does drink quite a bit of coffee throughout the day um, and she smokes, um, but says there's no way I could be pregnant. I feel absolutely fine up today and this has come out of the blue. Um, what's going on with me? So what do you think about this lady? So you start to assess her, you've gone through your history um, and this is her findings. What, just have a quick read through and see what you think. A little bit different to the last one. So in this one, again, airways patent, chest is fine, but we've got a good going tachycardia of 190. We put regular, but 190 is quite difficult to tell if something's regular from palpatum. Um, and remember as well that if your heart is going significantly fast, particularly in atrial fibrillation, um, going the rate um, peripherally may be different to your rate uh, over your um, atrium. So auscultation is really important to try and get the true rate um, of what the atrium is doing. Um, but blood pressure is okay, a few. Abdomen's fine, she's afebrile. She looks a bit anxious, but fine. Um, and you've sent some blood off and they're still pending. We know that she's not pregnant. I can't remember what my next slide is. So this is her ECG. A little bit different to the last one. What are our thoughts on this? I'll give you a couple of minutes to have a look. So 
So getting quite a lot of answers suggesting SVT. Okay, good. So it looks like an SVT. Are there any other comments? Or is that the general consensus? Yeah, that's definitely the general consensus. Yeah. Good, good. yeah. So, is there something else? No, no, I was just saying, yeah, the, the vast majority of people uh, do think it's an, S, uh, it's an SVT. Good, yeah. So, I would agree. I think this is an SVT. So, how are we going to manage this? Well, first, we need to think about what the diagnosis is. So, I agree, this is a narrow complex regular tachycardia which by definition is generally a supraventricular tachycardia. So when you're thinking about supraventricular, you need to think about what's the site of the arrhythmia and is it regular or irregular? So if you think about from an uh, atrial trigger point and it's regular, it can be sinus tachy, it can be atrial tachycardia and atrial flutter that's regular. So with a one to two block, one to three block. Irregular atrial will be um, atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter that's got a variable block. And then you've got your atrioventricular um, causes of your supraventricular super tachycardia, which are these horrible AVRT and AVNRT, which I really struggled with when I was at uni, and I still struggle with now. So this lady has got an AV, AVNRT. So I always used to get quite confused with what's this AVNRT and AVRT. So at the bottom, we've got two diagrams. The one on the left is your AVNRT. The one on the right is an AVRT. And I always think it's easier to remember AVRT as uh, Wolf Parkinson wine, because that's like the, the most common one. So in your AVRT, you have a physical accessory pathway. So an, an additional branch coming down here that is causing havoc to your, um, uh, your electrical system within the heart. In your AVNRTs, you get a functional disorder. So there's no physical accessory pathway. It's all within the AVN that you have this um, short and fast refractory pathway. The functional, so the one on the left, which is this AVNRT, is the most common cause of palpitations in hearts that are structurally normal. They normally come on and off, and there's lots of triggers for them. So exertion, in this case, caffeine, alcohol, subutamol, and amphetamines. It's normally younger women, and they can go really fast. They can go from 140 to 280. And generally, it's regular. I think if we look back, difficult to, I mean, I think it's, I think when it's going this fast, it's hard to always appreciate if it's regular, but this looks pretty, pretty uniform compared to something like atrial fibrillation. The other thing to bear in mind um, is um, that you so get narrow complex, which is characteristic of your supraventricular tachycardia. And some things that can help you pick out if this is an AVNRT is that the P waves in certain needs will be retrograde, so they'll be inverted, which I think if we go back, can we see them? I do think we can, can we? So the problem with them they're going this fast is that the uh, P waves start to merge with the QRS complexes, so it can be really tricky to pick up. Um, and again, we've got this ST segment depression, which we can see throughout all leads, uh, which is suggestive again of the, my the strain on the myocardium um, and is not necessarily indicative of a ischemic cause. So in terms of your treatment, um, the main management is again, your A to E, we know that she's stable and it's thinking about your valsalva maneuvers. So either get them to blow into a syringe, get them to bear down and strain, or there's the modified valsalva, which I did the other day and worked really well, is you get them to blow, 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 blow into a syringe, you let them to lay down, you lift their legs up um, and it cardioverted my lady immediately. Um, so sometimes doing the maneuvers, so when you go over the carotid, you do carotid massage um, or getting to blow in the syringe, variable success, um, but it's the first place to start. Remember with carotid massage, number one, only do one carotid. Don't do two carotids because they will lose card, uh, perfusion to their brain and they will pass out. The second thing you should do is auscultate over the carotids and make sure there's no raging breweries that you're going to do a carotid massage and send off some sort of emboli. Not to scare you, but just like to cover yourself one carotid and have an auscultation before you do it. If that's not working, adenosine is the main treatment. And that's to, first you can cardiovert, secondly, it can also reveal the rhythm. So if it's going this fast and we don't know, Sometimes giving adenosine means it slows it down enough that you can get an ECG and say, okay, it's flutter or okay, it's an atrial tachycardia. Um, so having an ECG next to you and someone who can work it quickly is always helpful. The main thing to do is warn the patient that they are going to feel absolutely shocking. 
I remember having to watching it being done as an F1 and watching this heart rate go from 200 to 150 to 100 to 90 to 50 to 30. And I think my heart went down to 30 whilst I was watching it. And then it goes back up again. So you have to warn them they're going to feel shocking, but it will be temporary. And make sure you've got your monitoring on. The main contraindication for, ad for adenosine is if they've got severe asthma or COPD, because it will send them into bronchospasm, in which case verapamil will be an option. And other agents you can use to um, control, give rate control, would be calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, and amiodarone is always a backup if adenosine doesn't work. Long term, generally these are well tolerated and can be managed um, either patients doing their own Valsalvas um, or rate control, but sometimes they need um, ablation if it's ongoing. But generally, you know, although it is going fast and you do need to slow the heart rate down, they're quite well tolerated. So what if the ECG for one of these ladies looked like this? Obviously not the one going at 190, but what are your thoughts on this ECG? Any ideas? Any thoughts coming through? So we've got a couple of comments suggesting Wolf Parkinson White. Yeah. Good. I think that's a good spot diagnosis. So main things of Wolf Parkinson White. Uh, remember, this is your AVRT. So this is that there is an accessory pathway. So the bundle of Kent, uh, which is also getting involved in sending um, signals from your atrium to your ventricle. Problem with um, these, these, these pathologies is that if something changes the refractory, so if for some reason there's a skip beat or the original impulse from the uh, atrium to the ventricle is delayed for whatever reason, the accessory pathway can kick in and you start to get this refractory tachycardia where um, it's going from the, rather than going up into the atrium, it's just going around in the ventricle and they're high risk of getting ventricular tachycardias from, the, from this. So the main things to pick up for with Parkinson White is, um, so you've got your P waves, a really short PR interval. Um, there's hardly any space between the P wave and the QRS. And can you see this up slant slanting there from the, just next to the PR, the, um, the QR bit, there's a delta wave, which is um, significant. You can also get this T wave inversion in your um, anterior leads, um, which again is, and is suggestive of with Parkinson White. Um, so don't panic too much if you think you're thinking about um, ischemia. So um, kind of what we've said, so sinus rhythm, very short PR intervals, you get your broad QRS and delta wave um, and can get inverted T waves and it mimics your retro ventricular hypertrophy. I've mentioned to pre-excitation and they can present quite sick. Um, so they can either, it can show this wall Parkinson white, it can suggest go but they go incredibly tachycardic and you can also get concomitant atrial fibrillation as well. The main management for these is, the question is again, is this patient stable or unstable? If they're unstable, you shock them. Uh, it's a synchronized shock. So the idea of synchronized cardioversion is that you are trying to give a shock on the R wave. Um, so th there's a certain setup on the machine. I think it's 50 joules you give. If they're stable, then you have to give some antiarrhythmics. So you're thinking about um, sotalol, amiodarone, flecainide. You avoid these drugs, so didroxin, verapamil, because they will shorten the refractory period of your um, normal pathway, which means the accessory pathway can start to kick in and you'll start triggering BTs. And beta blockers don't really work. So there's quite specific um, management for these. And again, it would be cardio driven and you'd have to refer these people to cardiology. And long-term, the management is ablating the accessory pathway. Lovely, so that's the young people. What time are we on? Okay, we're nearly done. So um, you're, still the, you're still in a &E, you're still seeing patients, and uh, you've now picked up Mr. B, who is a 74-year-old gentleman with palpitations. Shocking. So he's had 24 hours of palpitations, no red flags again. Um, it's been a bit under the weather the last couple of days. He's had a bit of dysuria, been a bit hot and cold, not eating and drinking as much. And he's a no type two diabetic and hypertensive. Uh, these are his, um, his examination and his bloods. So um, again, AB is fine. 
C, he's a bit tachycardic, so 140, and you think it's irregular. Um, abdomen, bit of suprapubic pain, it's a bit low grade temperature, and he's got a positive urine dip. These are his bloods. So a um, bit of a science, a little bit of infection from the white cells in the CRP. His so creatinine's a bit off baseline, sodium's a bit high, and electrolytes are fine. And his TSH is within normal range. This is his ECG. What are your thoughts on this gentleman? Have we got any thoughts? Yeah, got a few initial thoughts coming in. Um, so people are suggesting dehydration or AKI with a UTI. Yeah, lovely. I think that's reasonable. We're also getting some comments suggesting AF. Yeah, good. I think that's good. So the, from the history and the examination and investigation findings, we've said uh, UTI and dehydration. And then the ECG, we said AF. I think that's good. So um, if we look at this ECG, we can say rate is a bit difficult, um, but I'd say it's probably going about 120, 130. Um, it is P wave wise, can we see any P waves? Not convincingly consistent P waves throughout. Um, so PR interval we can't comment on. We have a narrow complex tachycardia that is irregular and the ST segments look okay. This looks like high takeoff from V2 and axis is fine. Might be a bit of ST depression in V3, but again, it looks isolated. So we have got a patient with atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular rate um, who has signs of hypovolemia and possible infection. How are we gonna manage this patient? We've done our A to E approach. We've got some bloods. What would your management be? I promise this is one of the most common things that I see on one well, of the wards in an a &E. It's always fast AF. Any thoughts coming through? So getting a couple of comments suggesting fluids, antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Good, so we're treating the underlying cause. So atrial fibrillation can be triggered by hypovolemia, um, either from infection, dehydration, bleeding. Um, it can be from electrolyte abnormalities, but we've checked those and they seem okay. Hypothyroidism can trigger atrial fibrillation, but again, that seemed okay. What about if you gave some IV fluids and you gave some antibiotics, but he's still going fast, what would you like to do? So people are now discussing rate control. Mm -hmm. So beta blockers and, and the like. Yeah, good. So we need to give them something, don't we? So we can do initial management. Um, generally with these patients, it's on this slide. Um, so firstly, is there a cause that I can treat? So have they um, gone into heart failure? Either they've had a big MI, gone into heart failure and atrial fibrillation. Have they had atrial fibrillation and gone into heart failure? Are they dry and dehydrated, got an infection that's driving it? So you just do a good fluid status of examination before you start giving anyone any fluid. Um, if they're hypovolemic, by all means, IV fluid resuscitation. Um, and I would at this gentleman, he sounds dry from, from the history we've got. So remember your fluid resuscitation, you're giving boluses, so 250 to 500 ml of sodium chloride or Hartman's and you're reassessing. So for every intervention you do, you must reassess. Fluid bonus, reassess. Fluid bonus, reassess. And you're giving those boluses over 15, 20 minutes. Once you've given a couple of boluses, you can give a maximum of two liters bolus um, because if it's not working at two liters, they're gonna need something stronger like vasopressors, et cetera. But once you've given some bonuses, if there's a response to the blood pressure and the heart rate, you can move on to slower bags. So four hourly maintenance fluid, six hourly maintenance fluid, depends on the patient. I tend to always give magnesium 
Um, magnesium can drop your blood pressure, to be aware, but generally, if I have a patient in atrial fibrillation, I give them some mag. Um, because sometimes that can work really well. Um, I don't know the physiology behind it. Me and my flatmate were discussing it today because you give MAG for lots of things, asthma, anaesthetics, we give it for pet analgesia. Um, we give it in preeclampsia, like a wonder drug, but IV MAG, and treat the infection. If that doesn't work, so in the acute setting, um, from the guidelines I've looked at for St. George's and for Kingston, uh, which is where I work, um, you can terminate, apparently, if AF is in 24 hours, you can terminate with flecainide. I've never given flecainide in my life. And I would be very, I think I'd be cautious to give flecainide on my own. Um, other options, so the most common that I've give, given is either bisoprolol or metoprolol. So bisoprolol, um, you can give a stat dose. If their blood pressure is holding, they're not asthmatic. If they're not septic or bleeding and you're going to crash their blood pressure, bisoprolol is reasonable. Bisoprolol um, can take six to eight hours to kick in. Um, so the alternative is given um, oral or IV metoprolol. IV metoprolol can kick in within sec uh, kind of 30 seconds a minute. Um, you see quite a rapid change, but it tends to wear off after five, 10 minutes or so. So it's quickly reversible. So we tend to give it if we want to see if it, you know, give it, see if it works. Um, and if they don't, you know, if they start to have bad side effects from it, it will wear off quickly. Um, but because it wears off quickly, it doesn't always do the job uh, long term. The other option is digoxin. So digoxin I tend to give if patients have a known history of heart failure. Digoxin is a good drug. You give loading doses of 250 to 500. 250 if they're little, bad renal function, 500 um, if otherwise. And you can give up to, I think, 1.5 milligrams of digoxin over multiple loading doses. Remember with digoxin, it takes six hours for it to kick in. So you're not going to see immediate response. You're going to have to leave your patient tachycardic. Um, but within four to six hours, you'll start to see the joxin kick in and you can always give them another bonus afterwards. Equally, if you're given to joxin, once you've given your loading doses, you then need to give them a daily dose. Otherwise, all of that loading has been wasted. So starting them on 62.5 um, or something of digoxin once you've had your loading doses. Um, Diltiazem is another option. So a calcium channel block is, is an option as well. I know there's always a medical school I always remember being completely stressed by rate versus rhythm control. Um, mind the bleep have got a good uh, summary on this online about um, atrial fibrillation and they have said that the indications for rhythm control is generally if it's acute onset in less than 48 hours, if it's paroxysmal, it's a young patient with a structurally normal heart uh, or if there's heart failure then talking to cardiology about rhythm control may be more appropriate. But generally, I've always done rate control um, on my own um, and this sort of, sort of product jobs tend to work quite well. Um, so these are the medical management options from the guidelines at my trust. They may be slightly different where you work. With atrial fibrillation, once you stabilise them, the main things is uh, thinking about the stroke risk. So calculating the Chad's VASC and has blood score. And they'll need to be referred either to cardiology as an inpatient or outpatient or to a arrhythmia clinic. I haven't gone into too much detail about atrial fibrillation because I believe there'll be another Mind the Bleep session just on atrial fibrillation, but I couldn't really do a palpitations lecture without it. And then the last one, I promise, oh no, well, kind of, this man, you go back to him um, to tell him your excellent management plan that you've come up with and you think, oh, he doesn't look very good. He looks very pale. Um, he looks quite clammy. And you quickly redo the blood pressure and uh, you get this blood pressure of 75 over 40. And he's going, oh, I really don't feel very well. What are you going to do? What is your next management? So you now have a hypotensive, peripherally cool, tachycardic patient who is complaining of a presyncope sensation. Any takers? Are you still all out there watching me, or am I talking to myself again? Still plenty of viewing. Still plenty. Okay, thank you. I think everyone's just deliberating on on what to do in this in this emergency situation. Okay. So we're getting a few comments suggesting that this is shock, fluid bolus, rapid fluids, check blood sugars. Yep, good. I think that's all reasonable. Someone suggested considering adrenaline. Yeah. 
So your adrenaline, adrenaline generally tends to be confined to your uh, anaphylaxis and your um, uh, sorry, uh, cardiac arrests. Okay, this is metaraminol, there's ephedrine that you can do for the blood pressure. But I think, let's think about in the context, this is a patient who you know has had atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular rate, who is previously stable. I agree, I think given the context, we say, okay, well, we think he's dry, he could be septic. This could be sepsis driven, completely reasonable. Um, and I think giving some fluid bonuses, um, treating the infection is reasonable. But if you've given fluids and you've given antibiotics and this is his blood pressure, in the context of atrial fibrillation and a tachyarrhythmia with a hypotension pre-syncope, any thoughts on what we could do? Because you're right, he's in shock. So you need to think about what's driving the shock. Is it sepsis and hypovolemia? Is it something else? So we've got a few comments coming through suggesting DC cardioversion. Yeah. So I think this is, firstly, this is a situation of I need more help. My golden rule with sick patients is I ask myself, am I happy to walk away from the patient? So firstly, am I happy to walk away to go make a phone call to ask for help? Or am I happy to take a blood gas and go over to the machine or walk to the other water machine and run it and come back? If the, question, the answer to my question is, I'm not leaving this patient's side, you hit the alarm or you call for help. Um, you get more people in your vicinity and then you put out, uh, you either get senior support by the phone or you put out a peri -rest. Um I have low thresholds for putting them out. I don't care about putting them out. I'd rather put them out and people roll their eyes than not put them out. So I would say in this situation, immediately with that blood pressure, if he looks unwell, with that tachyarrhythmia, call for help. So generally, the golden rule is, is if you have an unstable tachyarrhythmia, so with the, any of the red flags, they're candidates for DC cardioversion, um, which you will never have to do on your own. I've never done it. Um, I quite like to do it. Um, I don't quite see how it's done, but um, I've never done it. And uh, you would need to, lots of people around to ensure the patient's safe, um, particularly in atrial fibrillations with the risk of blood clots. There needs to be a conversation about um, the risks of throwing off uh, blood clots, etc. But obviously, if the patient is unstable and deteriorating, you need to prioritise the cardiogenic shock first. So in unstable, the learning point is unstable tachyarrhythmias. Um, you need to do for DC cardioversion is one of the first things you need to think about. Um, and DC cardioversion in my trust can only be done in resus uh, or in ITU. Um, we weren't allowed to do it on the wards. So another thing to think about logistics of where this patient's going to go. Lovely, this is the last one I promise. Thank you for sticking with me on this very muggy um, evening. Um, so Mr. B, uh, You've gone in and actually the history tells you is that he's had a two hour history of palpitations. Um, no red flags that he can think of, um, but he throws in, oh, actually I did have an MI a couple of years ago, um, but I'm still type two diabetic and hypertensive. Um, this is his uh, observations as he walks through the door. So SATs of 99%, respirate 22, heart rate of 190, low blood pressure of 73 and 40 and afebrile. And the nurses have already rushed him around to resus. And you get into resus, and this is what you see on the rhythm strip on the cardiac monitor. I don't know about anyone else, but that puts my heart rate at about 200 itself. Um, so the nurses have already printed off an ECG for you, and this is the ECG. What do we think is the problem? Got a few early birds coming in with uh, VT. Lovely. Yeah, this is VT. So this needs to be a, this is a spot diagnosis. Um, and generally, this is probably one of my worst nightmares um, to see. Just would really make me anxious. Um, so this is a broad complex tachycardia. Um, in some instances, just be careful. People are paced. Um, sometimes you can look at a pace rhythm strip and think, oh my goodness, what is this? Um, but this is very distinct in that if you look at the morphology, there is no, the morphology is completely off. There's no P wave QRS. It's all just massive mountains of uh, squiggly lines. So your morphology is completely different. You'll still maintain some morphology and pace leads. So we've said our diagnosis is VT. What we're going to do? It's the golden question. 
apart from maybe wipe away a tear, try not to cry, take some breaths. Any thoughts on the management of ventricular tachycardia? So shock, cardiovert. Mm -hmm. DC, cardiovert. Yeah. So getting, getting a strong consensus for cardiovert. Yeah. Good. Lovely. Let's have a look. So um, ventricular tachycardia, it's sustained ventricular tachycardia if it's more than 30 seconds. So some people go into runs of VT and it settles, which is less of an emergency. Can be monomorphic like we saw or polymorphic, which is the Tossard de Poir, where it kind of winds all the way around the um, baseline. Um, but regardless, if it's monomorphic, polymorphic, you treat it the same. Predisposing conditions to it, so channelopathies, Brigada, Wolf Parkinson White. Um, if they have QT prolongation, either from things like Romano Ward, um, other, I can't remember the other, um, uh, pre was it the congenital QT prolongation syndromes? But also remember common antibiotics like macrolides, erythromycin, clarithromycin, metoclopramide, haloperidol, methadone, domperidone can all cause P uh, QT prolongation. Particularly remember the um, uh, antipsychotics are big offenders for this. So drugs can, can be iatrogenic. They may have uh, used needs disturbances, so hyper, hypokalemia, uh, hypo, uh, magnesemia, and calcemia can cause it as well. Hypothermia is a big trigger, and if they've got structural heart disease, so if they had just had an MI, that could they can go into present with ventricular tachycardia. Equally, if they've had they've got left ventric like chronic left ventricular scar tissue, they can go into runs, and physical structural uh, problems with the heart, so um, uh, heart failure, Hockham coronary artery disease, can put them all at high risk. So the management, um, this was on um, life in the fast lane. I thought it was a really good um, division of how to approach it. So VT, remember, is part of your um, uh, ALS, your adult uh, um, advanced life support or your ILS protocol. So if they are pulseless and they are on VT, it's a shockable rhythm. Your two shockable rhythms, your VT, your VF, your non-shockables are asystole and PEA. So in a shockable rhythm, you're putting the pads on and you're giving three shocks. Um, as per the AODS protocol, you're starting CPR whilst you're getting everything ready, always putting oxygen on and maintaining the airway, and they'll be, you'll be given adrenaline and amiodarone. Adrenaline you give kind of uh, every three to five minutes, and amiodarone you give after the third shock. Um, remember in your cardiac arrest, you go through your H's and your T's. Um, if it's not familiar to you, you'll do it when you do your ALS, pro your ALS course uh, as F1s. Um, but it's important to remember that you can have a ventricular tachycardia and no pulse, and that is a cardiac arrest, and you treat it as such, um, which means pull the alarm and put out cardiac arrest. That's, the, that's your management. Red flag, so they have a pulse, they are conscious, but they are hemodynamically unstable, they've got crushing chest pain or signs of ischemia, then heart failure, or their ventricular rate is more than 150 beats per minute, then you're going to have to DC cardiovert them whilst they're awake. You're going to give them three synchronized shocks. So remember, synchrony is with the R to R wave. In CPR um, situations, so in a pulse situation, there is no R waves to, to synchronize to. So you do unsynch uh, unsynchronized cardioversion and cardiac arrest. It's synchronized when there, there is a pulse. So they need three shocks. You need to try and think about what's the cause and can we reverse it? And then it depends on your trust. Some say give lignocaine infusions, some give amiodarone infusions, procainide infusions. Um, I think at my trust it's give boluses of lignocaine and then an infusion and amiodarone if it doesn't work. And the other thing you can do that I was reading about is overdrive pacing. So you can do external pacing on the patient uh, if whilst you're sorting out the tachycardia version and you basically pace them to a slightly faster heart rate than normal. So say 100, 110. And sometimes that can just um, reset the heart as well. So you've got your CPR management, you've got your red flag management, which as you've all said, cardiovert, reverse the cause and consider IV infusions. And if they're stable, although you get to breathe a sigh, a sigh of relief, it's still a medical emergency. They still may deteriorate. You still need to get senior support. Again, it's gonna be amiodarone, sotalol infusions. Um, if you're given medical therapy and that doesn't work, you need to cardiovert. And whilst they're stable, you need to get any therapist involved to sedate them because it's not pleasant to be awake for. They may need to have pacing. Again, you're going to reverse and treat the cause. And if in doubt, give a bit of mag because it's the magic drug. Um, main thing is you don't give verapamil um, because uh, it will make things worse. So 
I think it's a good way to divide it. So pulseless, red flag, stable. But regardless, it's all a medical emergency. You need to get senior support to you quickly. And that's it. So I hope uh, this has been helpful. Um, I'm more than welcome to have suggestions because it, it was quite a big topic and it was difficult to try and get breadth. So I hope it's been helpful. And thank you for sticking with me. I know we've gone over a bit. So um, summary take home messages is that palpitations can cover an array of presentations from the reasonably benign to uh, medical emergencies. We've had a talk about what investigations you would help with the diagnosis and how you'd approach these patients. As with any patient you see, start with an A to E approach and consider if, ask, ask yourself the question, are they stable or unstable? Are they compensated, decompensated? Um, and the key for everything is calling for help early. I want to emphasize that we've gone through the management, we've gone through specific managements for all these things, but the expectation of you as F1s, junior doctors, is not that you are starting amiodarone infusions, you're not starting lignocaine infusions. The expectation and what you want to learn to do is to recognize patients are unwell, start your A to E assessment, call for help early and work within the remit of your experience and your knowledge. There is no expectation that you're going to be putting pads on and coordinating DC cardioversion. But if you can say, ring your med reg or put the peri rest out because you are concerned this is an unstable patient with a tachyarrhythmia who may need DC cardioversion, that's all we're asking. And I, that's the most that I would do at, at this stage. I'd put the peri rest out, start my A to E, start thinking about what I might need. Um, but not many people are going to be making these decisions on their own even at peri arrest situations med reg itu cardiology will be having discussions about the most appropriate treatment so be aware of the treatments it's good for exams it's good for general knowledge and understanding of the pathology but do not worry about having to learn all this off by heart we just want i just want you to be able to feel a bit more confident when um seeing patients on call who may present with palpitations and hopefully you are now more confident in approaching these patients you're happy with history taken feel a bit happier with the ECG interpretation, thinking about how to investigate them and are more aware of emergency management of these patients. These are my references. Um, I'd really recommend them. Um, this one at the top and at the bottom are the specific guidelines for St George's and Kingston, but um, I think they're really excellent for general knowledge. And uh, there's some other guidelines in there that might be helpful. So love you. If you have any questions, if anyone's still with me, I'd be very grateful if you stayed and well done. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and I'll hand back to Addy. Thanks so much, Lizzie. We actually had a lot of people sticking around to the end. There's still about 80 people on the Facebook Live. Um, I posted a, a link to the feedback in, in the in the comments. If if anyone who's still with us could fill that out, that'd be really, really useful for us. And you can also get a certificate for attending. So hopefully there's, there's something there for everyone. Um, in terms of comments, we're just getting lots of thanks in the in the chat right now. That was a really, really great session. Um, we'll just stick around for a minute or so, just in case there's yeah. any questions. Do you please give some feedback just so it helps us make the sessions uh, more tailored to what's useful for you? Um, and also it means that I can demonstrate that I have given some teaching to using my portfolio. So I'd be really grateful. Um, but I would like to hear about your feedback of how the, the structure of the session, because uh, I was debating how to do it. So do let me know. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'll try and answer questions if needed. We'll just give it another 30 seconds or so. Yep. I think everyone's pretty happy with, um, right. with how that was. So thanks to everyone who, who attended and thanks again to Lizzie for putting together such a great webinar. And we'll see you guys for our, for our next webinar. Thanks so much. Great, right. thank you. Bye. I'll just give it two secs.